Welcome to Horasa's India Meet 2020. I am Himali Chapya, Senior Assistant Editor at the Times of India and live from Mumbai, now described as a COVID-19 hotspot. This city is defined in various colors based on the COVID positive cases it has. However, this city is merely a microcosm of the large situation prevalent across the world. At a glance, if one looks at the village level map of India, one can see how dense this country of over a billion people is. We are, however, not just divided by geography, state-wise or district-wise. Put a tiny zone of a metropolis under the scanner and we can see huge class disparities. The way we live, the schools we attend, the gadgets we hold on to or the healthcare systems that we can afford. For instance, Kerala has health indicators as good as New York. But in Bihar, many health indicators are as bad as the worst in sub-Saharan Africa. And then, at a deeper level, we have another divide, wherein we, we talk of access to the very fundamentals, access to toilets, to clean drinking water, and food. Interestingly, though, this class, is, this class of society is so interconnected with the large Indian middle class. Factory workers come from the sprawling shawls and the army of other staffers, guards, maids, cooks, chauffeurs, all come from the very slums that the middle class looks at from the sky leaping towers that they reside in. This is the daily frame of reality in India. And hence, an outbreak in a place like Dharavi, where, um, and I'm going to share a screen with you, uh, where about 800,000 people um, live in one square mile stretch and 1,440 residents share one toilet, highlights the magnitude of the challenge India is facing. But the lockdown has indeed shaken the Indian society. Today's topic, India's society shaken by COVID realism, cannot come at a better time. The lockdown in India has had a huge human cost. It has literally crushed the poor. Supply chains were affected and employment got lost. Migrants unable to afford a life city lifestyle went back home in large numbers, having no money to purchase even the basic essentials. However, as India switches on its Indian economic engine, it is young, yet unable to do so fully. Cases are on the rise. The labor class is not yet back. Um, and yet the argument is that the size of, with the size of a country like India, many cases are still going undetected. Amidst all that, there is another school of thought that speaks of lives versus livelihoods and states that the country needs to open up fully and quickly. In the months of lockdown, what did this nation do to spruce up its health infrastructure? Did the number of medical professionals go up? Not really. My panelists here will initially make their opening statements on how India and other nations will face the new and uncertain future when social distancing seems to appear as the only solution hence far. After that, I will pose questions to them and then there will be the closing remarks from each of us. So joining me now is Professor Arindam Banik, Professor at the Institute, International Management Institute, India, Sandhu Rose, CEO of Telnu USA, Raghu Khandelwal, founder and CEO of Ace Global Ventures, who joins us from Singapore, Urvashi Sahani, Founder President Study Hall Education Foundation India and Professor Steve Wilkinson, Director of Macmillan uh, Center for Indian International Studies, Yale University, USA. Uh, Professor Banik, would you like to start with your opening remarks, please? Good morning from India. Um, the topic is actually uh, COVID-19 and how it has in a broader perspective, impacted societies. Uh, I'll focus here only the education sector, uh, how it has impacted uh, 
education sector in general and then more preferably i'll i'll try to focus on how it has impacted higher education particularly the business education in this context now if you see the traditional model of education in 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 all emerging markets uh, or or you take uh, all all mature economies uh, uh, what are the basic focus of those education memorization and standardizations uh, that was the basics uh, not focused heavily on uh, job oriented courses education for education sake the knowledge sake that was the basically principle in those days uh, so for learning uh, methods and mechanisms are concerned suddenly we 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 have seen a transformations uh, as uh, the chairman of this particular session rightly mentioned uh, the social distancing is a major uh, statement now or major uh, or powerful indicator um, what sort of uh, things to be focused in this context if social distancing is the norm then perhaps other are basically changes according to that condition that implies social distancing is a external factor and then you are just your mechanism tools and techniques according to that condition if that is the norm what we see now in in the in the context uh, uh, in the current world the courses tools and techniques and how they are actually delivered for example uh, if you are talking about job orientation uh, the traditional model of teaching is lecture method standing somewhere you have the powerpoint slides that's the only technology perhaps you can have and then you, you keep on delivering you do not know what is happening on the other front that is students or other stakeholders what we found out suddenly there are stimulation uh, there, there are live projects uh, uh, there are case based learning and there are also not writing some say, 50 or 60 or 2 hours in exam because on understanding of the subject with the help of viva or with the help of some other mechanism these are the disruption so what examination models are concerned what we see actually in terms of the uh, online education uh, you must have seen there is a huge demand for online education uh, when deliveries are concerned i am talking about the first part i concern is the long term program not now we are focusing on what are the short term program most of the cases we found the online is the only mechanism and uh, according the market is actually reacting according to that condition what is that condition you must be knowing the one of the famous uh, courses that an international finance company sponsored or funded courses of uh, course outlines these are actually meant for that that particular purpose now a teacher who is actually traditionally equipped in in lecture methods he or she has to depart from that mechanism which is online social distance the major criteria the external forces and i have a feeling that disruption if it are not resolved how to resolve it it means that whole teachers that's one of the powerful stakeholders uh, if they are not well trained in, in in the new line of teaching uh, perhaps that is a problem we will, we will be laggard here in, in this particular perspective now we see other two to its aspects say placement for example uh, is the covid time uh, the employers are not interested even despite the fact that it's a covid time our employment are like rising but there is some employers many some kind of people for example selling their education product employers not interested to come they said online interview just fine for them so is a new way of thinking about uh, uh, how actually a structure new structures are created and how that things are actually disrupted you talk about entrepreneurship it is interesting new entrepreneurs actually emerging for example 
I'm sure one of our speakers will talk on uh, emerging market, low or bandwidth level, access to computers or internet. These are the major problems. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure one of the speakers will talk on digital divide. I'm not going for that kind of thing. What I'm trying to say, there is a possibility of new entrepreneurs or emerging entrepreneurs here. You know, Indian take Baiju, for example, uh, as powerful company selling education services. If you consider a remotest area somewhere in India, in Northeast states, you can say there is no bandwidth, uh, people are using only mobile, uh, it will create inequality in the society or something like that. What I found in African case, I was reading on the other day, uh, uh, there are new companies are emerging. They are actually supplying internet, assured supplying of the internet bandwidth to that particular school, and then uh, uh, started uh, doing all kinds of disruption in order to resolve the COVID situation, which has actually created so far. Now, some of the things that are also equally important: uh, the understanding the cost uh, and to the financial aspects of that uh, of the whole thing. People say online computers uh, are, are basically cost effective. Uh, uh, that is true. Uh, people say that, uh, well, students who are going to the class, they are not understanding the topics. Uh, uh, some are getting bored or something like that. Uh, I have a feeling uh, those who are basically making this kind of statement, perhaps uh, the teachers or, or other stakeholders should have proper training. I say, I repeat what he says, should have proper training how to go about or how to equip or how, how to train the children in according to that condition. You know, if you see the, for example, Zoom platform, then if we have a whiteboard with you, uh, perhaps you can do a lot of things on that, you know, playing with the student, gaming them and all that. But traditional model of teachers are actually not well equipped that one. And in these circumstances, what I feel that uh, the stakeholders at the management boards and others should also understand this particular aspect and train that teacher according. Otherwise, what will happen, it may be a complete failure and you can blame the technology for that one. Technology is actually scale neutral. It's scale neutral. Problem is that how you are actually creating conditions that to acquire that technology. Don't blame the technology. It's a scale neutral. How you are acquiring that is important. That's my point. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Banuk. Um, that that was a very valid point. A lot of Indian institutions have had to move from classroom methods to suddenly going online and a lot of them were unprepared, especially large traditional universities with a student population of 7 to 8 lakh do not know how to even conduct basic examinations online and are planning to cancel all kinds of examinations. Um, uh, Sanjo, would you want to go next, please? Sure. So um, thanks, Emily, for uh, the opportunity. So. Talview is a company where we uh, work with a lot of large enterprises to support them in their uh, frontline hiring. So we support organizations in retail hiring, in insurance sales hiring, uh, call centers, uh, delivery. So a lot of last mile kind of hiring. And we have been seeing the impact of uh, COVID-19 in, dif uh, uh, in different uh, scenarios. So uh, the first uh, time we started encountering these issues, we uh, started bucketing our customers into two different buckets. So the first one was customers who were continuing to hire, especially in uh, delivery and a lot of those uh, segments where uh, customers had to cope up with the new reality and had to continue to hire. And the second uh, was customers uh, who were uh, had to put a post to the hiring because their business was significantly impacted. They had to shut down. But they were uh, put... Uh, Training plan for a business recovery three months, six months down the lane uh, with the assumption that things will go back to normal uh, in that time frame. So that, that was our first, uh, I would say, experience or first uh, reaction to the current pandemic. And 
what we have really seen especially in the last uh, three months since then has been that the customers who are planning for business recovery the unpredictability or uncertainty around that particular segment still remains uh, very high so people who were thinking of continuing to hire and pe- people uh, who were the industry where we expected things to go back to normal in three to six months uh, we we've seen that there is still a lot of uncertainty and when i specifically talk about geography so we work with customers across uh, us india some of the other uh, uh, southeast asian countries as well uh, indian co- co- companies have been actually uh, i would say the most impacted from our uh, current uh, understanding of how the market uh, for example in the us many of the companies have already put in place mechanisms to restart their hiring but in india there is a lot of uncertainty uh, and when we try to understand that scenario again the challenge has been indian uh, while some of these other economies have been doing fairly well uh, pre covid indian economy was already uh, entering a phase of uh, slow growth when covid happened and now with the impact of covid uh, the real uh, i would say slow down is uh, kind of accelerated and the uh, impact is expected to last for a longer time so that seems to be from a livelihood standpoint that seems to be a sign of forcing a significant challenge for uh, the workforce in india right now and while companies have been putting uh, especially customers whom we work with they have been putting in mechanisms of different nature to uh, support their existing workforce and to restart hiring as soon as they can uh, uh, the unemployment or employment uh, um, challenges are going to be uh, at least from the current uh, scenario we don't see a immediate respite so th- so given that context i think the most important thing especially for uh, the workforce to think about is how do they make uh, the and we primarily work with the uh, a uh, white collar and i would say entry level the the segment which is between white collar and blue collar and our insights are largely from those segments so there uh, i think a lot of focus have been to shift uh, employment from segments uh, which were traditionally the job providers to segments like delivery or segments uh, which are more part of the uh, part time or the uh, gig economy where you could stay your livelihood in some way or the other uh, in short to medium term that is a big focus uh, focus on upskilling and trying to uh, be relevant in the new economy which is evolving which is largely remote which is largely uh, based on services which are delivered remotely that seems to be a big focus uh, amongst the workforce right now so those those are some of the early trends which you are seeing it uh, unfortunately i think uh, there is still a lot of uncertainty and uh, uh, lack of predictability when it comes to livelihoods and employment in the country right now and uh, i think a lot depends on how some of the current f- uh, fiscal stimulus which uh, the government has uh, introduced and also how fast we are able to uh, make that uh, balance between li- lives and livelihood like you mentioned him amal Uh, how, how fast we are able to make the uh, or strike the right equilibrium that that will be critical for india right now absolutely thank you so much sandro i i think you very correctly pointed out that you know upskilling and uh, training uh, is is huge is a huge focus uh, you know right now uh, from companies you know which have employees sitting at home they, they want all of them to you know uh, up their uh, training uh that takes me to you rajiv do you want to make your opening statement sure thanks amali and uh, good afternoon thanks. to everyone from singapore uh thank you frank and rasif for uh, inviting me to this platform event uh i'll have a more macro approach uh, to the topic because it involves both india as well as you know countries around the world uh so the way i would like to open is that uh, you know we all know then this is an unprecedented crisis of sorts uh, with limited past experience and with no black and white solutions uh, but i feel the world needs to kind of park global geopolitical uh, considerations temporarily and come together to pool resources share ideas 
and you know, bring fast track solution and fight this pandemic together uh, as humanity as a whole. Uh, I think deep thought leadership and courage, political courage and administrative courage is needed, uh, backed by a efficient, uh, you know, public support uh, management system with very strong information gathering and dissemination systems to adjust uh, very quickly to the ever evolving dynamic situation on a day to day basis around the world with respect to the pandemic. Uh, I think dealing with COVID realities uh, needs a critical equilibrium between uh, considerations of lives versus livelihoods. Uh, in the context of you know, demographic, uh, demographics, uh, socioeconomic status of each nation, and of course the impact of policy action, uh, what kind of impact it will have on each country. Uh, my view is that the impact um, and the probability of COVID-19 on lives is a mathematical exercise. And even if it might uh, seem very scary, it is still an uncertainty with a big if. Whereas actions like shutdowns, lockdowns, you know, circuit breakers, uh, or even strict social distancing measures with a constant sword hanging over your head of a sudden lockdown uh, that could come in any day if, if cases flare up, is uh, you know it's 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 a it's a certain impact on livelihoods, uh, and and I'll explain in a moment on what kind of impact it could could potentially have. So broadly, I see six different sets of factors that law and policymakers need to look at uh, before uh, you know uh, formulating policy action. The first that I see is obviously dependent on the size, uh, the proportion of the working population as well as the density of the population. So, for example, a place like Singapore, uh, which has a limited aging population, would place much higher prioritization on lives. Whereas a country like India may be forced to prioritize livelihoods uh, you know, as a reality. Uh, the second is obviously the income and savings levels. Lost him, I think. Yes, I think he got it. Okay. No, I think he got the connection. Um, we we come back and yes. catch up with Rajiv. Um, okay, he's here. Rajiv, we lost you for a moment. Um, not wasting any time. Um, Udvashi, do you do you want to talk to us? You work with schools. Do you want to talk to us about that? And we we'll come back to Rajiv when his connection is better. Yeah, sure. uh, Did we get uh, this connection? Yes, yes, we had lost you. Can you hear us? So, Himali, do you want me to go? And, um, yes, please. Okay. We'll come back to that. Okay. So, thank you, uh, Himali, and thank you, Horasis, for having me here and joining from Lucknow, India, Uttar Pradesh, which is the north, uh, north uh, it's a northern state and one of the most uh, economically and socially backward states of the country. Uh, I'm an educator and a women's rights activist, and so I will speak from that perspective. And I will be talk, following up on uh, Professor Arindam up from and speak about school education. And definitely I want to speak about the digital divide because I think all sorts of divides became visible during this crisis. That was really the good thing that happened. The migrant labor crisis pushed all the poor that have been neglected for so many years. They've always lived in crisis and it brought it to the fore. The images were relevant. And I think next to the migrant labor crisis, education has never been spoken about so much or written about so much in the last three months. Because that also came to the fore. And there, the digital divide was immediately apparent. You know, the government's first response, 32 crore children were out, 320 million children were out of schools. And that is a huge number. 
And so when the schools shut down, the government's response in all of us was that education should not stop. Let's go online. The sad part was that, and there was a report saying that only 12.5% of the students really had a line to go on to at internet access, you know, just like stay at home. And there were very few people, many people didn't have homes to go on to, right, go and stay at home. And so what did we do as educators? First of all, the digital in our own organization, where we reached out to 5 million children and we work with, it's a very inclusive organization. We work with rural children, urban poor, urban middle class children, children with special needs and with a strong focus on social justice and inclusion. So 75% of our children are on the wrong side of the uh, digital divide. So what did we do? Whereas the middle class children there again, as many of you mentioned, we had to retrain and reskill. Nobody was ready. Not the best school in the country. Like I am is having trouble. Can you imagine? No hope for schools. They had no idea how to go online. So they needed training. They needed very strong leadership. Like you mentioned, uh, Rajiv, in your brief introduction, that leadership skills were very important. They needed hand holding. They needed peer management. They needed some assurance that all will be well and a lot of quick retraining. So agile organizations like us, we quickly managed to ramp up with that. So their parents were also prepared. They were also eager and they were able to support them and things were not so bad. Whereas the children on the wrong side of the digital divide, girls and children from urban slums, children from rural areas, and, that, and the majority of our population is still there, 66.6% .6 in rural areas. And even out of the 32 crores, if I may hazard a guess, I think 75% at least were and more were on this side. All right. So when the government carried on online, 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 all the digital resources were pulled in and we have enormously, we put them on the Diksha platform. There were no devices. There was no internet access. Even in our organization with the best will on the world to get connected, 30% children migrated straight to villages. So we lost connection. Out of the ones we did connect, 58% we were able to connect. Only 56% had internet access, 44% normal phones. So what do we do? So our teachers then had to become very, very innovative. And that was the good thing, too. And with many children, special needs children, they used phone calls to teach them. Right. One hour a day. Then otherwise small videos were made and sent. And uh, pictures of the textbooks were taken and sent to them. Right. And of course, before that, where do what do you need? Do you need food? Do you need health services? Do you need masks? Those were provided. Right. And then we realized, all right, whenever the government does whatever it does to uh, bridge the digital divide, what we did was we set up a smartphone library. We got hold of old smartphones. We got hold of everybody that would lend us, got our funders to give us some money. And we uh, gave girls who didn't have smartphones, there were multiple users at home. And we said, all right, you have three sub siblings, you teach them, get children from just the neighborhood, neighbors. And at least one is to nine. And we've been able to reach a large number. We started digital Sathi program. We gave small laptops in rural area, gave them the dongle and said, now you try and organize the people around you and teach them and set up like clustered learning spaces. Now with this challenge, and it has been huge. I mean, schools have not been shut. I, in fact, I think I need a vacation now. We've been working so hard in this last three months. Is that the, what are the learnings and what's the silver lining in it? The silver lining is that divides have become visible. And now I hope the government is going to ramp up and do something about it. And the digital divide, you know, in this digital age, it's no longer a luxury. It's a necessity. So while we're building highways, we need to reach Internet access to the last mile. And it will have a huge effect in upgrading the quality of education. Learning spaces will have to move out from schools and also be in localities Set up learning clusters. And I'm talking about schools. Use local facilitators. If they have Internet, we can train them from urban centers and reach quality education to them. And of course, reskilling teachers, changing the curriculum with a strong focus on social justice. Train them for democratic citizenship education, which we have curricula. Social entrepreneurs, NGOs have been working for years. Our organization is 34 years old. We have a gender curriculum. We have a caste curriculum. We have all sorts of innovative curriculums that address social justice in classroom for younger children. Whereas livelihoods are important. Of course, they are. But, you know, we will not have functioning democracies. We will always have divides. if We can't raise a generation that learns to think equal. 
So we must revamp the curriculum, move away from transfer of information to the 21st century skill. I think this has told us 21st century is here. In fact, one fifth out of the way now. And it's a new world we are approaching. And so retraining, teacher training needs to change. Curriculum needs to change. And we must get gear up and understand that education has to become a community subject. Local people have been able to do the most that they can because they were easily accessible. And if we can empower them with internet digitally, it will leapfrog many of the problems which we are finding and we are learning. And we will, if we can, we'll be able to support them and we'll be able to actually bridge these divides if we can bridge the digital divide, including the gender divide, which means women must have more control over technology. Right. So I'm going to right. stop there and uh, maybe say more later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Urvashi. Uh, Rajiv, do you want to uh, complete what you were telling us and then I'll move to Professor Wilkinson? I would, I would, I mean, I would suggest we let Professor Wilkinson complete his and then I can uh, kind of finish off mine. Or would okay. you want... Uh, Professor Wilkinson, do you want to go, please? Yeah, sure. Um, Thank you. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm a professor of politics, and so I thought I would talk a little bit about the uh, political dimensions uh, of all this. First, I, uh, I agree with what uh, Rajiv said earlier, that um, a large-scale total lockdown is not the right strategy for India and uh, probably isn't the right strategy for most uh, developing uh, lower- and medium-income countries. And there are a variety of reasons for that. Uh, my colleague here at Yale, uh, Mushfik Mubarak and Zach barnett Hall, have uh, done a fair bit of research and writing on this, and, and they highlight three big reasons why large-scale lockdowns uh, aren't appropriate. Firstly, um, India has a much younger population than uh, Europe, for instance. So that has a big effect on mortality rates. Maybe the overall mort mortality rate might be half or even a third of the mortality rates in Europe or North America, uh, given a more youthful population. Even if some comorbidity factors like uh, asthma and things like that due to pollution might actually be a little higher. Overall, the, the population is, is uh, less likely to, to suffer as high level of deaths. Secondly, uh, one of the reasons why you'd want to flatten the curve and have a large lockdown in uh, the West is, is because you have sufficient healthcare infrastructure uh, in terms of ventilators or uh, hospital rooms, that you're actually uh, getting a big gain through uh, through doing that by relieving pressure on the healthcare system and pushing out um, uh, patients uh, and not overloading the system. But if your healthcare system is more overloaded in the first place, as is true in many uh, lower income countries, then you don't necessarily get that gain. And then third and probably most important um, is the fact that the economic costs and benefits of lockdowns just look really different in lower income countries. Uh, you've got larger proportions of uh, lower income people and these vulnerable people, many of whom uh, have a few days of income or several weeks uh, of, of income, if they, if they lose um, money, they, they uh, don't have a big buffer to actually uh, replace that income. They simply cannot withstand the costs of large scale lockdowns. So in India, 84% of households report a substantial income drop due to COVID. That figure in the US is big, but it's uh, it's in the 45% range in terms of the total number of households. So very, very different. Uh, in the US, 37% of all people, according to some surveys that have been done, uh, can work from home. In most developing countries, though, that figure is 10 to 20 percent. So really big differences. Um, academics, in fact, uh, people like me are probably the worst people to give advice uh, because we uh, are the most resistant. We are the most able to work from home. Around 83 percent of uh, academics and jobs in the U.S. can actually work from home. People in the higher education sector uh, other high groups in that range are finance, management, professional jobs, 
But people in agriculture or restaurants, areas like that, it's under 10%. So I'm very conscious that when we give advice, things look very different um, personally uh, for people like me and for some of the people I think on the call as well than they do for many of uh, the people that, that we're talking about. So a phased reopening, uh, I think, makes a lot more sense than a complete uh, lockdown. There simply isn't another political choice when 84% of the population in India is suffering a big drop in income. So what will the effect of all this be in politics? Um, one thing I think I'll say by way of introduction is that federal systems pose particular coordination challenges. So I live in the state of Connecticut and our peak death rates were at the end of April. Um, and things have been going down ever since uh, at the end of April. But there are 10 states in the US now that are uh, having new peaks, and there's no bar on transportation between the people from those states and the people in my states, given the federal system that we have and the constitutional uh, situation that allows people to travel freely within states. So it's obvious that in my country, just as in India, the federal system poses particular coordination challenges in solving these things. What do I think the effects are gonna be uh, of all this on politics? Um, it was. A slowdown in the economy uh, that, that was happening anyway in India prior to this. Um, there was increasing criticism of the government because of the slowdown, arguments of the GDP rates. In the short to medium term, though, the government has done a pretty good job with large-scale cash infusions, pump priming of the economy, replacement of income. And the fact that things are bad everywhere due to this pandemic, plus its own actions, I think, are... Um, are, are going to have positive uh, political effect on the government. They're, they're already having it. It's diffusing blame for economic slowdown. There's previously a lot, a lot of that had been directed towards the government. Secondly, I think we're likely to see new sits and demands on the supply side in several different areas. One is health. Um, India has a very um, undersized public health sector relative to lots of other countries. It spends less as a proportion of its GDP than other lower income countries. Uh, uh, the government in India has already committed to raising this by two and a, two, two and a half percent by 2025, but other politicians have talked about rises five, six percent, even beyond that. Mantra Energy uh, talked about this. So I think one thing you might see is uh, greater political pressure for change in the health sector, especially because many people are realizing that the government health sector um, plays a very important backup role. A lot of people aren't necessarily getting the care that they would like from private hospitals or getting access to private hospitals. And they're seeing the government more as a key provider in the health sector, whereas a lot of the growth in the past 10 to 15 years has been in the uh, private sector. Secondly, I would, uh, I would second the comment that's been made about education. In the U.S. as in India, um, there has been a very different kind of um, effect of, um, of the lockdown on education, depending on which side of the digital divide you're in. And many of the public schools have done very badly by comparison with better resourced uh, schools. In India, only around a quarter of the population have decent internet, according to the NSS um, in 2017. Sorry? Cut, Professor Wilkinson, but you know, we only have seven minutes to close this. Uh, oh, panel. sure, sure. Okay, sorry. Um, no, no, no problem. I know a lot of the points that you're mentioning are uh, extremely important, but we're racing against time, and I'm going to uh, let Rajiv speak. Oh, for please do, yeah. Sure, sure. Though I was just getting started and I had to, I had to uh, speak a lot to speak, but yeah, the technical glitch beyond my control. Anyway, I'll get back to it. So I was talking about six factors, uh, six sets of factors that, uh, you know, policymakers could consider. So the first was obviously the population. The second was income and savings levels, where I was going to mention that almost 85% uh, of India's employed population is in the informal and organized sector. 92% of Indians hold wealth less than $10,000. So, and 90% of these people's lives would have been either, uh, you know, livelihoods would have either been lost or been materially and adversely impacted. 
that needs to be kept in consideration then there's obviously a social benefits framework which varies from country to country for example a us or a eu states have unemployment claims india doesn't they have nhs you know medical coverage india doesn't those factors need to be taken into consideration then what is the time frame to develop a reliable vaccine you know is it 6 months 12 months 24 months even if it is 6 months is is a shutdown or lockdown sustainable for 6 months no it isn't some people will say you know it you know have lockdowns served the purpose of actually stopping infections and breaking the chain i would say that every country almost every country in the world has has had lockdowns between 1 to 3 months but infections continue to uh, go up new cases continue to come in and reversals continue to happen some might argue that if shutdowns hadn't happened the cases might have been much more but the question that i ask is that is is that is suppression the answer to this problem or are we simply deferring the pain because sooner than later shutdowns will have to go away and if infections start growing then then what will you do so those are the kinds of arguments that i have a big area of impact is obviously each nation's fiscal balance sheet and what is the impact on the economy you know i i have uh, statistics which say that anything between 6 to 9 trillion dollars of global gdp will be lost because of the short uh, shutdowns and lockdowns during the current year that's almost 6 and a half percent to 10 percent of global gdp you know governments will be doling out 2 to 3 trillion dollars uh, to cushion impact yeah and all this will come from either taking more debt or eroding past reserves which will only add more to the global problem in that sense so yes i mean if you look at one important point is that if you look at comparative mortality rates 164000 people die every day in the world for various reasons including things like 36000 deaths for communicable diseases 23000 for cancer covid has averaged about 3700 globally in the last 5 months india has averaged about 75 in the last 5 months yeah i guess uh, you know there was there was quite a bit we only have oh. about 2 minutes left and we have a few questions rajiv sure uh, may i please take them yeah so uh, we have uh, professor nilanjan banik from the bennett university who who's asking that it's only migrants who've gone back what is the strategy that the state government can follow to employ uh, you know their own migrant workers who return because these people are not maybe going to come back to a metropolis like a bombay professor banik do you want to take that question yes uh, uh, thanks for the question uh, an interesting question in fact uh, if you see the background of the migrant laborers they are basically a, from the major cities to the to the, the parent states most of them actually semi skilled or unskilled people Um, why they have migrated because jobs are not there in their own states so because of that they have or maybe the relative wages behavior because of that reason they have they have taken a uh, job in other states and i'm sure that uh, concerned uh, uh, the um, persons here have have already mentioned that uh, what are the problems in case state government say the rural or central government that's a different case but when they are actually migrated jobs that are available for example bengal is concerned or central government is focusing give them job uh, in the neighbor in rega means you have you have the job available they are basically unskilled type job and then they can somehow survive and when things will be normal they decide whether they will stay back or not i i have a feeling is the right um, state government perhaps should not have to take some kind of responsibility will they remain in this unskilled sector or will they train them or retrain them according to market conditions and if not only providing food or some help to them uh, it is also state government responsibility to retrain them in the current framework and that is all part of the whole story yeah. sure thank you professor ban i think we have only 20 seconds left i think too many panelists so much to discuss uh you know but i want to thank all of you for coming on board from professor banik who spoke on higher education to 
Urvashi, who looked at school education and what the, a lot of trusts and funds in India are doing, to what Rajiv said that you know leadership is uh, critical right now as we open open up uh, you know the Indian economy. Uh, to what Professor Wilkinson also said and uh, what uh, Sanju pointed out about you know hiring and training and retraining of staffers in industry. Um, I guess. Um, I guess it's been a fruitful discussion, and uh, we need to sign off because uh, you know the time is up. Thank you all for joining me here. Thank you, Horasis, for having us. Uh, namaste. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Panelists, and thank you for thank watching you. it. Yes. Yes. Thank you, and good luck to all of us. Yes. yes. Thank you. All the best. Stay safe, everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you very much, Ali. Thanks for moderating. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.